Hi, welcome to Ethereal Mechanics video number 31. This was a unplanned for video. Uh, basically, uh, I want to talk about the path forward and there's some miscellaneous updates and also there's a section on antimatter that uh, is kind of an addendum to black holes and galaxies uh, and talks about, well, we're going to talk about it. So no, no, no sense talking about it when we're going to talk about it. So basically the outline of this is we're going to discuss a path forward with Ethereal Mechanics a uh, little segue and discussion of journals and what they are. Uh, then we're going to talk about the rules of acquisition. There's a couple of updates and a couple of new ones. And then there's a couple of uh, errata to previous videos, uh, things I missed after I uploaded them. So I didn't put those little oops things in them. And then we're going to talk about antimatter with respect to galaxy and black hole stability and multi-arm spiral galaxies. Yeah, very hodgepodge of stuff. Okay, so what's next? The new mathematical construct is needed before we can go into the hardcore electromagnetic physics. And I've decided to write a paper for submission to a math journal. Uh, this may hold up the videos for at least two months. Uh, and the main purpose of this is to gain exposure of ethereal mechanics uh, to neutral venues, not through. Uh, the new math construct uh, is a small addition to, and the reason why I call it neutral is because uh, to math mathematics, the new math construct is a small addition to existing knowledge, so it's, it's not threatening. Whereas, you know, ethereal mechanics requires a paradigm shift in what people believe. Uh, so it's too controversial, and I'm sure if I ever tried to submit a paper, it would be turned down in a minute. Not even a minute, a microsecond. And so we learned something. I was doing some quotes, and I, I found this from Max Planck. Uh, this is so true. A scientific truth does not triumph by convincing its opponents and making them see the light, but rather because its opponents eventually die and a new generation grows up that is familiar with it. <laughs> and so what are journals? Some people, not, a lot of, even people that submit to journals kind of really don't understand what journals are. They think that a journal is this all-seeing body of people that gives credence and truth to your submission. And that's not really what a journal is. Okay, a journal is like a magazine or newsletter which features contributions from scientists. And okay, fine, people know that. But why they began is because 100 years ago, before the internet and before telephone, uh, scientists from different parts of the world wanted to keep abreast of what everybody else was working on. So they set up a journal where they could all contribute what they're working on to the journal, and the journal would publish it and send everybody else, so everyone would know what everybody else is working on. Okay, and that's what's the purpose of the journal, so people of a similar interest can keep in touch with each other in the latest developments in the respective fields. And so it was a very limited audience magazine or publication. Okay, but because there was a limited number of pages that could be published periodically and then mailed out to subscribers, okay, the purpose of peer review was not to judge the correctness of the submission, you know, to say, ah, oh, it's the irrefutable truth we must all believe. That's not the purpose of journals. The purpose of the peer review was to make sure that the submissions made the best use of the limited pages. So, you know, they're not going to put something in there that's crazy or that's, you know, that's minor. They're going to put something in there that's, that's you know, pretty, that's, that's neat and that's going to be a major contribution to the field. But they're also going to check for appropriateness. Obviously, if you're, if you're on the board of peer review for a journal that's about electromagnetic physics, you're not going to accept anything that's related to dinosaurs. Unless there's some ways they can make the argument that it has something, you know, into reaction. And also you're going, they're going to try to preserve credibility. They don't want to lose subscribers. So obviously, you know, a, a journal about quantum mechanics isn't going to be publishing ethereal mechanics because that's not their thing. Um, and you know, they don't want to bring discredibility to their publication so people you know, drop out and say, oh, why am I subscribing to this crazy magazine? And I'm sure politics has something to do with it. It's who you know kind of crap. All right, but today an online blog serves this function, okay? Because it can be made uh, limited to subscribers by password to keep you know the, the field limited to the people that you know really need to know or that are part of the particular. Or it can be made open to the world, like I'm doing with my blog, my YouTube blog, for whatever it is. And most journals now are online anyway, so you know the online is the best way to connect everyone together to keep abreast what everyone's working on. So that's really, a blog is really the today's version of what a journal used to be. And I found this when I was looking for quotes. Um, it is wrong to think that the task of physics is to find out how nature is. Physics is concerned with what we say about nature. And I think that could be verified as physics is concerned with what humans say about nature. 
I think there's a little physics is concerned, a little misspelling on brainy quotes. Also, to increase viewership, I'm going to be developing a new video series with more of a mainstream twist. Call it Distinti's World, where I'm going to talk about global warming with some simple experiments, distortion of realities that we see in the news, and how to properly use a model magnet. This is more of a new electromagnetism related video. And Terrence and Philip videos. Um, you know, hoping to bring traffic by smacking around controversial topics. And also, uh, traffic on YouTube is. Uh, I mean, if, if, if cute and cuddly has an effect on the traffic because, you know, a uh, grumpy cat can get traffic. My cats can get traffic. <laughs> uh, now we're going to do updates of rules of acquisition. For those people that haven't followed from the beginning, I have adopted the Ferengi rules of acquisition to have kind of a set of rules that we look at to keep ourselves honest when dealing with science. And rule of acquisition number five, where there is pain, there is gain. And pain is an acronym in my world, which means paradoxes, anomalies, inconsistencies, and nonsense. So if you go find the pain in the scientific theories, like the overunity and the theory of relativity, then we can push science forward because we have to get rid of those anomalies. And I found a Niels Bohr quote, how wonderful that we have met with a paradox. Now we have hope of making some progress. <laughs> and there's a new rule of acquisition number 25 beer. We are pyramid builders. Pyramid builders refer to people who I describe who believe that things must be unnecessarily complicated and grand for it to be right. Like in Egypt, it was a simple hole in the ground that defeated the tomb robbers, not the overly complicated and expensive pyramid. I don't even know those were for tombs, but that's what they're thought to be. And scientists are looking for a grand unified field theory when the actual truth may be so simple that it's right in front of our face and we can't see it for what it is. That's the way I'm going. And here's one uh, my new one. Today's irrefutable theories are tomorrow's alchemy and voodoo. Okay, corrections. In video 27 about the sun, in the very early part, I said that the mass of the sun is increasing. What I meant to say was the density of the sun was increasing. That was a correction error I only saw after I looked at it on YouTube. And also, in one instance or another, I swapped the word fusion with fission. It doesn't really matter. I'm sure by listening to it, you'll understand what I meant out of context. And in video 30, at 1 minute and 47 seconds in, I incorrectly have KF uh, equal to 2.7. It, it, KF is really 4.05 times 10 to the minus 21. I got the numbers backwards. get everything backwards. So now we're going to talk about antimatter. And to talk about antimatter, we need to talk about normal matter. Okay, in ethereal mechanics, okay, normal matter is matter that sinks in a gravitational field. And normal matter is a simple definition that... Well, let me first explain this down here. You have, this is the new induction model which relates the inertia between uh, point charges. Okay, and so if you have two po like charges next to each other, they're going to have inertia that's going to make them fall in a gravitational field. Oh boy, that looks dirty. Okay, and, but if you have two dislike charges next to each other, they're going to experience negative induction, which would be po uh, negative inertia, and in a gravitational field they're going to rise against the force of gravity. Now, some people might say, well, that rising against force of gravity violates the laws of physics. No, no, it doesn't violate the laws of physics. It violates the laws of physicists. Okay, just because physicists believe something doesn't mean that's the way nature works. This works. You can, you can account for all the energy here. There's no problem once you understand the ether and how it all interacts. Okay, so the new theoretical mechanics definition is for normal matter is matter that has more positive inertia than it has negative inertia. So it will tend to fall in a gravity field. And to have more positive inertia, you have your like charges closer together and your uh, and, the, and your and the, and the dislike charges separate. And that gives you your if you want to see a good example, if you go to my document section on my website, which is stinty.com docs any hydrogen PDA, it shows an application of this where we compute the inertia of a hydrogen atom to a very high degree of accuracy. So in ethereal mechanics, antimatter, and not to be confused with the Hollywood or quantum mechanics antimatter, antimatter in ethereal mechanics is a material that contains more negative inertia than positive inertia, so it rises in the gravitational field against the direction of ethereal acceleration. Now to put these two together so you can kind of get a feel for how almost identical they are, okay, since the interaction between 
uh, like charges creates positive inertia. Okay, and the farther distance between the dislike charges creates negative inertia. But since these are closer together, in this case, there's, and I'm not, let's ignore the cross, so I may make it confusing right now. So that since these are closer, there's more positive inertia than there is negative inertia. So this is positive or normal matter. So in a gravitational field, this guy is going to go that way. If the, if the ether is accelerating that way, then this block is going to accelerate with the ether. But in this block here, you have the negative charges are closer together than the like charges. Okay, so your positive inertia is smaller than your negative inertia. And so this block in this acceleration, ether, ethereal acceleration field is going to rise against the force of ether. That's the subtle difference between normal and antimatter in new, and it's not a case like in Hollywood where if matter and antimatter come together, you get a wicked. It's, nah, it's just ethereal mechanics is going to show that everything is composed of massless. I'm sorry, inertialist charged particles, and how they're in, arranged can give you matter or antimatter. Nothing more complicated than that. So remember, galaxium from the discussion, I believe, was video 27. I think it was 27. Okay, the outer the charges in the outer layer of a black hole um, have ether raining down them at the speed of light, so the charges are inert. So the distribution doesn't really matter. This is the surface layer of the black hole, the galaxium layer, and you have ether, ether flowing down at the speed of light, which means the magnetic and the Coulomb forces completely cancel, and these are completely inert. But let's say for some reason the speed of the ether drops to let's say 95 percent the speed of light. Well, that means the Coulomb forces are going to be active. And they're not going to be as completely canceled by the magnetic forces. So what's going to happen is you're going to have dislike charges starting to attract each other and like charges starting to push apart from each other, which is going to start driving the surface to what would be more uh, like antimatter. So in other words, it's going to try to decrease the distance between the dislike charges and increase the distance between the like charges, which is driving this material toward antimatter. And then what happens is, uh, the quickest way that these chains can happen is they start forming chains that rise against the ether, kind of like the snake charmer snakes. Uh, and they're going to rise at a rate of 5% C, because they're going to stop rising at whatever velocity the speed of light is relative to ether, they're going to stop. So if the ether is only coming down at 95 percent of C, they're going to rise at 0 0.505 C. Okay, and that's the limit that's going to limit them to how fast they're going to, this thing is going to explode. And these chains just keep rising from all over the surface of the area where that ether is being, that flow is being diminished. Okay, and because the reason why I say that that happens is because when you have two black holes that obscure the ether flow, these inner areas are going to be the ones that are going to be destabilized because of the obscuration of the other body. And so the antimatter is going to flow out. And when the antimatter collides, it's going to start forming real matter, which is then going to spew out you know, radially. But because these two black holes are kind of like a rocket engine, they may push apart, and which would cool down this situation and then come back together and continue it. And then you get on again, off again as they bounce and that would create the multi-arms of a spiral galaxy. But at the very end when they lose enough mass that when they come together for the very last bounce they may fall within the inner event horizon which we talked about in a previous video where the viscosity of the ether does not allow ether to flow at high enough a rate to keep these things stable and once they both you know at a certain point they're going to get in there they're going to completely detonate with a massive very high inflation rate. And that's why the center of the galaxy is very bright and very clean, where the outsides of the galaxy is more stars and very dirty. And this is a, uh, a small idea where two get, uh, black holes collide. And because they're small enough, you get a little bit of ejecta at first until they hit when they go on to detonate completely. So this is really, these black holes are small enough just to be the core of this galaxy. And they hit straight on too. And these antimatter chains are highly unstable. The slightest nudge 
and they decompose into normal matter. And we're going to talk more about that later, but one, one idea I was thinking of, boy, these kind of really are remarkably similar to string theory or even DNA, except for their lack of stability. Uh, whether it's string theory or not, I don't know. I haven't studied string theory, but except for a little idea of the vibrating strings and all that other nonsense. But I really don't think so. But the, the, the mechanics of this is quite simple, and a computer model can show you how we can get all the different forms of matter all the way up to the, the chemical elements that we have. Anyway, thanks for now. Again, we're going to be about two months until the next, at least two months until the next ethereal mechanics videos. In the meantime, the other videos, I'll be releasing at least two. Um, and I think you'll have fun with those. Thank you.